Hello friends and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. If you're passionate about the tactical skirmish game that brings together strategy, lore, and creativity, you are in the right place. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, and stay updated with our latest episodes. If you want to support the show, check out our Patreon. Your support means a lot to us. Follow us by using the social media links in the podcast description for all the latest news, and be sure to leave a review to let us know what you think. Thanks for tuning in. Here's today's episode. Alrighty. Out to the Netherlands to talk a little bit about all the things going on in the Netherlands. Especially lots of rain. Lots of rain. (laughs) Yeah. Lots of rain. I assume it doesn't make it onto the battlefield. Do you guys... What do you? What have you guys been playing recently? You know, we we're touching base with uh, Daniel and Yop because the Netherlands has been coming up as a scene more recently. You guys went to the WTC, had some appearance there, along with I think eight other countries for the first year of Kill Team. Yeah, uh, that's correct. Oh, I was like, so I was, I was, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll take it over. That uh, I'm I'm currently playing Nemesis Claw a lot. I love my elites. Uh, when I started Kill Team, I started with the Legionnaires from the Compendium uh, book. Uh, sorry, not Legionnaires, but the, the Chaos Marines. Then moved on to Legionaries, and uh, well, Nemesis Claw was a no-brainer. What about yeah, you, the yeah? Claw, the Claw has been a very powerful team, very popular team. But as far as actual win rate goes, week to week, they haven't actually been crushing it as much as maybe people would have expected. But that might just be because they're limited by being elites in the current edition. Basically, you have a lot of counters and a lot of teams can 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 curb stomp you quite simply, quite easily. Uh, one wrong move can cost you a, a, a miniature, which you know is quite a lot for an elite. And prescience, prescience is you know better to go to Vegas sometimes. Yeah, the difference between a one prescience token turn and a three prescience token turn, which allows you to shrug dice, delay activations, and what's the last thing? Uh, it was sort of a gain feel no pain a in the Oh yeah, 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 and gain a command point definitely. Uh-huh. So yeah, you can use them for a lot, but you know, against most teams, if they're not elites, you're you're going to to spend that to, to just wait out that turn. You know, let someone else move up forward a bit more, get in range for that lovely double kill. Meanwhile, we've got Yap here. He's been playing a lot of Eldari. It sounds like you've been doing mostly Eldari Drukari specifically. It sounds like. Yeah, so I uh, I'm I'm a bit of an Eldar fan, uh, but I don't really like how they play in Kill Team. So I usually dabble, then get frustrated and move on uh, to something else. So uh, I took uh, scouts to deal with WTC, um, but to be fair, that wasn't really uh, a loving match. I think scouts are horribly boring to play, but they're uh, pretty good, and uh, I think they did pretty well in the draft. So uh, yeah, I took scouts, but. It, I love the idea of a fast, high damage team, but I think in uh, in kill team uh, they uh, they also die really, really quickly. You got very few operatives; they are not very forgiving. So, uh, um, in the end, I uh, I always prefer the horde teams. Just uh, they just feel so good. The, the, the amount of control you have over the game. Um, so uh, yeah, I think the most fun I've I've had is playing Fat Guard. So just having some more room to make mistakes or to make your opponent make mistakes because you have the extra activations. Exactly. So Yeah, and, and I did feel a, a little less random, even though you hit on fours, because you're not super reliant on getting those kills. It's not the end of the world if you're Plasma Whiffs, for instance. But if you play in Eldar and you're Blaster Whiffs, uh, you know you're going to have a bad time. If you're Blaster Whiffs and your Duelist Whiffs, you're basically getting the napkins because it's crying time. Yeah. <laughs> When it comes to building out the WTC teams, both of you were talking about uh, playing Nemesis Claw and Scouts. How did your team put together the team? Because we haven't really talked to too many team tournament people. And the US and Kill Team in general is not really doing a ton of team tournaments outside of two or three player tournaments. So I'm kind of wondering if you guys could give us the lowdown on how you guys structured your prep and how you guys selected your teams. Because I don't actually know all five members on the team. So... Well, in, team games in the Netherlands are non-existent, so this was our first introduction in uh, well, a, a team game uh, in that sense. And mainly, first thing we did is like, okay, what does everyone want to play? You know, um, we took we took an orc player because orcs are very well on the table. They, they can, you know, they have nice matchups. Um, we took a Galapox player, 
obviously, because Geller Box, uh, if if you put them down as attacker, they can choose the mission that's more favorable for them. Also, a very solid team, and I mean those feel no pains. They get you crying sometimes if you're against them. And lastly, was uh, a brood player. Uh, I don't think we have to go into their balance that much because brood is just powerful. There were eleven brood players on the WTC uh, team tournament. And how that went, well, you know, it was first off, it was just preference. You know, what does everyone like to play? And then let's see what we can make out of it. Because the main goal for us, it's it's a two-hour drive. We went there for fun and cheap beers, um, which we achieved. Uh, so, yeah, you know, we, we looked at that first. And then the, the roster we had uh, came up, which was on paper quite a solid team. Uh, but we haven't been out of the country a lot to play against others aside from... Uh, command point tactics tournaments. Uh, so we only knew what was going on in the Netherlands. And we're starting, as you said earlier, we're starting to get out there uh, to kind of see what the scene is out. And, you know, people starting to see us, hear about us, and uh, hopefully we grow more and get more experienced players. Yeah, I think in that prep, the main challenge for us was not selecting the teams, but getting people to play certain matchups. Uh, I think there's maybe... 24 to 30 people in all of the Netherlands that play Kill Team frequently. And about half of them are, I'd say, competitive. And so you've got 12 people. So I think maybe 60% of the teams we've never seen at a competitive level. So like none of, in, uh, none of us in our team, except for me, had ever played against a Wormblade team at like the highest level. So uh, we've never played into Inquisition. We've never seen Cults. We've never seen a... a proper brute player for instance our brute player had to figure it out on his own so for us the prep was really how do you how do you play against these teams that we've never seen that are dominating the meta right now yeah um i'd be curious to hear more about like that like the nitty-gritty on how all that pairing worked um for like setting up the games you said like choosing attacker the attacker gets to choose the mission um some of the stuff just like a real quick rundown on how that works and what were some of your like strategies and thoughts um what went well what went wrong um whatever you want to include in there um yeah so i i did most of the the draft during the tournament and uh so how it works is you do a roll off and whoever wins gets to uh, be the I think it was, the, the the names were sort of reversed, so I get confused. But I think you were the attacker if you placed forward the card. So you you said, okay, I'm going to attack with this team, and then your opponent could select two of their teams, and then the attacker would pick which one of those teams they would fight into, and then the the, the other team would select a map. So for instance, we would open with Galapox, and then you could also select a mission. You would do that at the end, but you know, most of the time people knew, okay, you're putting forward Galapox, so I'm going to be forced to play capture. And then your opponent would uh, put down two of their teams and then usually go open because you really don't want to play Galapox capture into the dark. So that's how usually uh, you pair them. And our strategy was basically, um, uh, well, you look at the, the teams like, do I need to draw anyone out? For instance, if we were playing against uh, uh, an opponent that had Corsairs, I was pretty focused on not having them pair up against Daniel because you don't want Corsairs into Nemesis Claw if you can at all avoid it. And we have Commandos and Scouts, so if we can like force those Corsairs to go into like one of those stat check teams, that, that would be ideal. Uh, so, uh, but usually we opened with Galapox and, uh, or Brood Brothers on loot. Uh, but we really, really struggled with opponents brute brothers so i had no idea which one of us would be best into a uh, brute let alone two because you need to have uh, two teams that can go well into brute brothers so that was our main uh, main challenge um, and i guess something to add yeah is that what i usually did is we called it throw someone under the bus so uh, uh, I would just give him a, a, a pairing, which I knew he would take, and then it would suck for that person. He would just go, okay, try to lose with as little, with as, little as possible. And it, it, it was our commandos player. I think he played uh, three or four brute players. <laughs> it was just always one. Sorry, it's your turn again. Have fun. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, uh, Commandos, I think, would be a reasonable matchup into Brood Brothers conceptually, just because you're tanky enough where all of your dudes can trade with seven wound guys. You have enough damage, theoretically, to kill a Patriarch if 
you have enough guys set up, but you do have to deal with Grandpa's babysitter, which is probably not the most fun. I mean, I said that, but our commandos player at some point just 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 shh, I don't want to hear it anymore. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, so another question I'm curious about when it comes to the elf teams, which one do you think is the best? Which one is your favorite? Uh, I think, uh, the best one is probably Corsairs right now, I would say. Um, but my favorite would be Hand of Jarkon. I think they're, uh, they're very fun to play. Uh, but I think Corsairs overall has a better toolkit than, than Hand of Jarkon. Yeah, and I'm I think fully sure of that. Yeah, I think I agree with that too. Yeah. I mean, unless unless we're going to see Harlequins get fly back in third edition, right? <clears throat> yeah. Um, Who knows? Definitely excited to I, see what happens there. Yeah, I'm I'm personally of the opinion that losing fly was not the end of the world. I think it's worse that the rule is written in such a way that sometimes it's literally worse than not having the rule at all. I think in some cases. When you're dropping, for instances, for fre- from very small uh, ledges, it's actually worse uh, to have the, the flip belt because you always have to pay the two, even if it's less than two. So that's kind of a, a weird thing. I don't think they've ever that. So, uh, they did. Uh, so the des- beta decima uh, thing. Oh, did they? Okay. But I think that what makes Void Dance so strong still is the 4++. plus plus Because elves struggle with survivability and just being able to sometimes tank those shots where other elves just fall. I think that's... I think it's a bit overlooked. Usually when a team gets nerfed, everybody drops it. But I, I still think they're up there uh, in the elf team's uh, strength I mean, points. As far as the week-to-week win rate, I think Void Dancers, while they have dropped off in popularity by a massive margin, they still have players who do okay with them or even well with them at small settings. Because it turns out all of the strong tricks, all the combat tricks are still there. They're just less reliable as far as getting to where they need to go and being a little bit more asymmetric against elite teams. Speaking yeah. of elite teams, you know, Daniel, what did you end up doing at the, the WTC? You know, we heard here that we had commandos and scouts be the stat checks and sometimes commando players getting thrown under the bus, as it were. You know, you are the Nemesis Claw, a team that requires a touch of babying as far as team settings go because they are elites. So how did your matchups go? What, you know, how did you guys pilot the team in the team setting? So mostly, obviously, I was put forward as defender. Uh, because if you put an, an elite player or an elite team forward as attacker, you're going to get a tough matchup with lots of melters and stuff that, that just can kill you in one shot. Uh, as for how I went, so from the seven games, uh, I won two. One against Scouts and one against Pathfinders on Into the Dark. Uh, mind you, that one was because the other player did uh, lose time, uh, and then I had a free reign on, on turn four. Um, it was tough. It was tough. So there were two games that I'd rather not talk about against a Wormblade player and a Blooded player, and that that they they just decimated me. Uh, Wormblade was on open. Uh, this guy was able with his Wormblade to, to basically block up block off everything. Getting cover was hard. Getting forward was hard. Uh, most trick I saw, or well, trick most tactic I saw used against me was to just make sure there's so much threat that I either I a give up. Um, an operative on turning point one to try and get free primaries. Um, or I should just bite the bullet, wait it out, and then hopefully get a charge off and, and get forward quickly on the second turn, uh, which was rather difficult against this worm blade player. He just destroyed me first turn. I, I couldn't do anything. His placement was great. Uh, then we had the other one I was decimated in the, the blood player on Into the Dark. I actually have no idea what happened there, but after that, it was time for beer for me anyway. So, <laughs> um, then the other ones were close ones. So, you know, scouts, uh, interesting team uh, because they have s- such an amazing ability to to kind of counter my uh, my faction tactical. So you know, so terror requires me to have uh, an objective on their side on which they are. Uh, well, scouts can just you know get on the point no matter what mission it is, and then next turn at the uh, strategic phase just dash off of it, and there goes my chance to grab something like that. So eliminate guard also falls off and makes it more difficult. Which was I think I had three matches against scouts, I uh, lost two, uh, but they were close and 
one one, which was on Into the Dark, which went quite nicely, uh, just because the person didn't dodge from those points enough. So you know what I found with Nemesis Claw, uh, they're quite easy to counter, and you have to look out for that. Like again with scouts, they can dash off points. Uh, if people don't sit on points, you, you got to work around that. And I found that was quite difficult. Mind you, uh, like Yap mentioned earlier, uh, we don't have many competitive players in the Netherlands. Going to WTC uh, was a big step up. Like the level of play was was quite high. Yeah, was there anything that the team felt that you saw at the tournament that you don't normally see in the Netherlands? Because I know that there's obviously probably a lot of steps up as far as, you know, thinking about the game, playing the game, doing all the other stuff. And I'm sure our listeners would be curious to hear what you guys felt like was a big level up, because that might be a thing that our listeners might not know. So level up, uh, I think the app's definitely going to say the same. Uh, seeing other people and them curb stomping you, that teaches you so much about the game because you see their movement, you see them thinking ahead. There were moments where you get to this table where you were ready to do your draft and people already walked around looking at the table and the draft was picked and they're like, yeah, I'm sorry, you're going to lose this because this this map is fully in my favor. And that depth, that level of, of being able to analyze uh, the game beforehand, obviously it's not written in stone, but just knowing the teams, knowing the maps, knowing what you could do... Uh, we noticed that other teams were just very good at that and having so much matches in obviously teaches you that. And there were some teams we never saw. There was one Inquisition player. Uh, I never played against Inquisition. I think, Yap, you won that game, right? Didn't you? That was a big win for you. Uh, yeah, I won against the, the Spain second team, their captain, the Inquisition player, which I was uh, pretty pretty excited about. Yeah, uh, I don't that's, think I mean, that's a big win. You know, Spain yeah. ended up, Spain took what, first, second, and fourth? Fourth. And, and yeah, then, fourth. Yeah. yeah, they came in second, and I don't necessarily think scouts into Inquisition is super great for scouts. I don't think it's terrible either, but it's definitely not super easy. So yeah, it was yeah, pretty not terrible, but better. you've got the stats to at least yeah. push them around a little bit. So if they make a mistake and you get a get your leader or your melee guys suddenly on their seven wound operatives, your opponent is suddenly playing on the back foot and playing on the back foot in kill team. If you don't see the line, can be very hard. Yeah, it, it was super close. I think I only won by uh, two points, and we both ended the game with I think at least seven or more operatives. So it was really the 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 waiting game. Uh, which I think they're trying to uh, murder with uh, the new point system in the the, the kill ops. But uh, yeah, we basically just went three three and then tried to uh, you know make something happen in the fourth turning point. Uh, I was obviously playing scout, so I got courier and got a reconnaissance, and I think he was also playing recon. I'm not one hundred percent sure, but he was also really really passive. So that was a really passive game. And for me, um, I play a lot on CPTS, and I've been playing there for quite a while. So I wasn't super shocked by the the level of the of the tournament. Um, I got trashed by Crude because you know how often do you meet a, a good Crude player? So that was definitely something else. Uh, and I lost the demons of all teams because uh, whoever plays against demons uh, is, that and the, is that the American team? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they uh, had apparently, a yeah. as their as their uh, get shoved under the bus team because twelve models with a. Seven wounds and a five up invuln, or no, not a five up in five up feel no pain with power swords without basically the scout swords means that you know you just stand around, wait yeah, for your opponents to spawn points, and then just slap you silly. And on in the dark, they can vomit at you, which is lethal five. <laughs> and yeah, they have yeah. one one equipment point pistols that are three five, hitting on fours, I think. So yeah, pretty pretty solid. Uh, get get your shit pushed around, team. <laughs> I got a stat checked. As a stat check team, that's basically I just uh, I couldn't kill him off. He just uh, and he out activated me, and then just the last two activates. He always put like an uh, icon bear back on the point. It was capture, so that made it uh, uh, super super difficult for me to to stay and in, in the points race. Um, so that was something. I mean, um, so for me it was obviously I think we lost all our matches where we played against the team for the first time. So uh, um, and that was definitely a lesson to you know get out there and get more teams. And another thing we really struggled with in the Netherlands, all tournaments are always three a day, period. You have three games on a day. And now we had to play four on the first day and then three on the second. And if you, if I look at the team as a whole, we did really well in our first match, which we won. It's the only matchup we won. And I think we played actually kind of well against Spain. We won two out of their five matches against Spain's second. So, I mean, I was pretty happy with that result. 
And I think we did okay against the USA. And after that, we had our first three matches. It all went downhill. I think after that, we just lost at least four of our matches, if not worse. So um, yeah, tournament stamina is definitely something we need to need to work on. Yeah. One one thing I I did want to mention as well uh, with the whole level up thing. What what interesting thing is to see uh, definitely at WTC is countries play different in the sense that. Uh, for my the two scout matches I had, one was against Italy, one was against uh, the Americans. I found Team USA to be way more aggressive on the table, as in moving their their uh, their benches forward, going in full for the attack, trying to shoot every turn. Something has to die. While versus Italy, the guy was just relaxed, laid back a bit, just slowly moving forward, you know, more controlling over the board. And you notice that with all these different countries, everyone plays just a tad bit differently. Like the Nemesis Claw players, also, you know, I was more of a more of a relaxing, trying to you know see where it's at, control the board, move forward, get my chances that way. And I saw others just just going for it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But that's an an interesting difference, perhaps in culture, of how Kill Team works, which is very interesting to see there as well. Yeah, it's definitely part of the fun of the global tournaments. You know, at the World Championships, you get to see lots of different people approach the game in a lot of different ways. Obviously, Spain took the overall team victory, but Alexa on Chaos Cult at the time played a very conservative game that just had a very reliable two hulks end up in your midline that was basically impossible to beat. (laughs) So seeing different play styles is definitely one of the big lures of these big world tournaments. Absolutely, yeah. You mentioned tournament stamina being a big thing that you guys didn't realize that you were missing out on compared to some of these other regions. You know, America has got its two-day tournaments. Everyone else has got their two-day tournaments. Is this inspired either of you to try to push for larger tournaments in the Netherlands now? Or are you? I assume with Hivestorm just around the corner, you guys are going to be making a big push to try to grow the scene on some level? Definitely. Definitely. Like we already mentioned next year, uh, we're coming back to WTC. You know, we're coming back with a vengeance, hopefully. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. But no, we're already talking, planning, like trying to see, okay, what can we do? How can we bring tournaments more uh, to the Netherlands? We've got different locations we're looking at. Uh, right now, there's really one uh, small, well, one guy, one person or group that's doing the tournaments we're, we're trying to expand that obviously the netherlands isn't that big but you know it would be nice to have more people come in and we're also noticing that uh the dutch kill team community it, it's growing uh more people are getting interested liking how the game works uh i also think that games workshop is, is showing kill team some more love the, the way they're announcing this new edition to me feels like they're they're seeing like okay there's there is something here that we want to move forward and that gets people interested so we're seeing growth and definitely the stamina is something we have to work on because now we can only do three on a day because it takes so long we have lots of new pay players coming in which is awesome you know don't get me wrong about that but it's more difficult to go for a higher level event if many players are not there yet it gets quite boring for them and you know days would take very long so we're definitely working on it uh yeah so we're hoping to get that going soon and if people from you know hear this and think like hey i'm going to be in the netherlands soon we're definitely going to start communicating outside you know get yourself over to amsterdam have a fun night and then come play with us <laughs> yeah and i think uh, personally something that uh we had planned for a while as a as a like the more fanatical group is to just go abroad i mean in the united states it's not that out of the ordinary to fly for like a couple hours to go to a big tournament uh, in, like if you go to London or uh, England or uh, that's like literally less than an hour but because they're separate countries it feels like it's a really big endeavor but uh, yeah we could easily go to uh, the UK or uh, Germany for example to do multi-day tournaments so we're looking at that as well for just the most fanatical uh, Dutch skill teamers and maybe get the Belgians in fold because where are all those guys I don't know if they're listening but jeez <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got to we've got to juice the numbers on the uh, European scene. So we do have a small contingent of European listeners. So if anyone's in the Netherlands wants to help improve the scene or get some games in against some people who went to the World Team Championships, you know, pay, you will have the links on the Discord. Hopefully, is there Ooh. a 
concerted or concentrated Netherlands Discord, or are you guys using Facebook, or where are you guys communicating with each other? Yeah, we have a two. we have a Discord, yeah, yeah, a Discord and WhatsApp. Apparently, WhatsApp is still very big in the Netherlands. <laughs> WhatsApp is very big outside of the U.S. It feels like. Yeah, but I mean, we've got both. You know, we got we we got a Discord which we're very active on, which is purely for the Netherlands, and we're also hosting our tournaments there and everything. So yeah, definitely. Uh, People want to come in and say hi, you know, more the merrier. So um, with the the journey across all these different chaos warriors, Daniel, um, have, like, do you feel like Nemesis Claw is a strict upgrade over Legionary or are there some strengths that you're missing that you kind of uh, have you thinking about Legionary at all? I'm I'm probably going to say something controversial here, but Legionaries died the moment the Nurgle nerf was introduced. And I know people don't like me saying that, as there is some awesome stuff you can do definitely with the other gods, but Nemesis Claw is a step up. I mean, the fact that you can just skip an activation with a Prescience token, that is so major for an elite team. And other elite teams just can't fight that. You you know, that is so powerful. So, nah, I, I think Legionnaires for me, they're left in the dust. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I still love them. I wish they would come back with a bit more of a stronger, with well, something at least, but Prescient Stakes takes it for me. It's so powerful. And then you have this banner or the Ventrilo card that can push people around open and shoot, shoot at them freely. I mean, there's so much tricks that Nemesis Claw has that Legionnaires just simply didn't have. And I think, I think they're lackluster. You know, when it comes to the new edition, maybe things will get updated a little bit. Who knows? Uh, that, you know what? I'm still hoping uh, if Games Workshop is listening, give me my World Eaters, man. World Eaters, let's go. Yeah, I'm fully the, there too. The true close combat team. <laughs> Yeah, uh, my legionary are world eaters, and I just play them as all corn, and uh, it's super fun. Uh, but I feel like it has, um, like one of the big things that Nemesis Claw and Pure Corn Legionary have is they have no way to ignore injury, and they have no way to ignore APL modifiers. So when people start like injuring and stunning you, you really suffer. Whereas like Mark of Nurgle still can ignore injury, um, which is huge, and I think that's that's another thing that's like. Elites that can't do that are are going to be struggling, um, and like intercession can ignore injury and APL modifiers and Phobos, and those are just like some of the, the in my opinion, some of my favorite, some of the strongest tools that elites can have. Um, I've I've only done like a couple games with Nemesis Claw. Uh, it's just I am another one of those just like push super hard, play really aggressive sort of players. So like the patient feel of Nemesis Claw isn't really for me. But they do seem like a really cool team, and they like the tools are incredible. The models are cool. Night Lords is just like a a cool faction in general. Um, yeah, they seem really cool. Yeah, I, I definitely agree on that. The the thing with stun though is there's a lot of a lot of, a lot of teams coming out with stun, right? Like even uh, even Brood has a way to put an activation down that if you're within the board edges, you get a free stun. Or you have to roll, I'm not sure. But anyway, there's a chance for you to get stunned. And on a three APL team with six operatives, that's major. That um, It hits you so hard. So I do agree, like Nurgle, no injury stuff. That that was amazing. Hell, even Death Guard Compendium on paper is quite nice. Although, again, you know, with the new things coming out, again, Nemesis Claw having all these extra tricks, they're kind of left in the dusk. If you would face Nemesis Claw player as... Uh, a Death Guard Compendium player, for instance, you're not going to cut it. Uh, you know, you just don't have enough. Although you can't ignore all these extra things that hurt a lot. I mean, stun. I hate stun. When someone says, "Yeah, you have a chance to get stunned," uh, I'm already uh, grabbing my tissues as well. <laughs> yeah, for the yeah. new edition, I hope they go the Patriarch route for elites. Bring uh, the Marines back down to, fi- uh, to five models, three APL, but you can choose how many APL you spend when you activate. I think that would be super cool. I have no idea if that's balanced, but I think that would go a long way. My guess is that, you know, with the some of the newer releases, you know, between Warp Coven and the Nemesis Claw, we've seen the baking in of double fight, double shoot as single strategic ploy things. I kind of expect that they'll probably go that direction first before they must muck around with activation counts, just because it feels like 
activation counts are relatively sacred. You know, with three APL, taking a break is important, maybe. But if you could double fight, double shoot, then whatever activations you have, you at least can always maximize them. And it'll let you play more ranges. And it seems like we're, they're already moving in that direction, so I wouldn't be surprised if they go in that direction. Uh, yeah, I think the downside of that is that being able to do a double fight or double shoot is really dependent on your opponent giving you that chance. So I think that like, if you're learning Kill Team, you're, like, your first level up is... Uh, if, you, if you're new to Kill Team, elites are going to like, do you in, right? You go to Reddit, see, how do I ever beat Intercessors? They're the strongest team in the game, right? That's like the, the trend on Reddit. And then we once you see figure on out... Our, we actually see that on week-to-week -week stats, too, where Intercession players, you know, generically across the board are, like, in the 37%. But if you look, every once in a while, there'll be a 3-0, and it's, like, a 12-person tournament in a small country, and it's like, yeah, they're still there. Still yeah, there doing yeah. Intercession stat check things on the lower end of the, the play scale. Exactly, and then once you figure out, okay, I should just be focused on not giving them uh, a two two for one kill. I should make sure that I can't double fight. Then they drop off significantly. So just making that free, um, I don't really see that solving the issue of just being so far out activated that you're just. Well, I think Shane really put it well. Like if you're playing elites, at some point you're gonna have to do something stupid and hope the dice don't fail you. And I I, I think that as long as they have six activates, that's just gonna stay true. Yeah, no, I agree. Hear me out. Jason's got the stupidest plan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, uh, I've been... So I pretty much, like, exclusively play Elites as well. Uh, like, at at the Las Vegas Open, which was a nine-round tournament, and then um, the seven... Was, was it, I think it was seven, or... At we Adepticon, played nine Playing some, some big rounds at, at like... Gone to a couple big events, and I just play all elites, um, all engage, and then just push super, super hard. And then, like, people can't wait you out. They can't deny you shots, because if in turn two I'm standing in your deployment zone, there's nowhere to hide. And basically, it's just, like, all six space marines just, like, stand on or over the center line by the end of round one. And, like, if you can get Overwatch in every objective... Um, especially if you can shoot their threats with engage orders before they even activate because they're trying to wait you out. They're trying to wait till you're done activating and then shoot you. But if that plasma gun dies before he activates because they're trying to be patient, you've got no more threat anymore. And then, like, by the end of turn two, you're just, like, you've killed all of their threats. Like, I've had plenty of games. They last, like, 40 minutes. People will kill two intercessors and I'll table them. And it's just, like, total craziness. I've done that, like... I've done that in some pretty competitive games as well. It's, uh, yeah, just don't use conceal I will, orders. I will note that the, part of the impetus of this strat strategic thing uh, working for Jason is that looking at how uh, Games Workshop has generally done their tournament packets, a lot of deployment zones use some amount of heavy and obscuring to let you deploy reasonably safely. So when Jason was doing it with Phobos, he was doing it without with a bunch of incursors, basically just nuking people in the back line. And then for intercession squad, if you can run up on these mid boards where you can stay relatively concealed, even if you're on engage and your opponent is playing two APL models, them getting to you on turn one might not be the most reliable thing without getting punished along the way. I'd be most curious, does it work twice against the same guy? I think that's yeah. a, a big question. It, it actually does, because there's been multiple people that I've played multiple times. I mean, there's a game, it was actually the first, that I, played against, um, I played against a guy on TTS, and he actually beat me the first time we played it. Like, he just saw all the angles, and it was all there. And then I played against him at Adepticon, and, but this was like round six, so I think he was kind of like you know a, a little bit a little bit tired a little bit like sloppy compared to then and then i just caught him on all the angles and and just like he knew it was coming he knew how it worked and and i you know like some sometimes it's just i don't know uh, like especially with incursors you could you could play it like a bunch of times in a row and if if there's like i think the boards are fundamentally designed in a way that it is impossible to hide from incursors yeah i can see that yeah well it sounds fun uh, and i do think there are definitely a couple of teams that don't uh handle threat saturation very well or very aggressive plays um blades of gain one of my uh, uh teams that i love to hate like they're so fun though 
Uh, I mean, yes, but they fold really quickly under pressure. Like if someone would tell me, how do you bleed Blades of Flame? Well, do like Jason did. Just run up to midboard and engage and force those straights and they'll be dead in turning point three. Yeah. So, yeah. And there's several teams, I think, that, that struggle with that kind of play style. Yeah, they're definitely Yeah, are. I think the idea is that most elf teams die to threat saturation which is why commandos and scouts remain such huge issues for them because if every dude can two shot you in melee and all of them have a melee weapon then it's really hard for you to trade aggressively because you go up and you make one mistake and suddenly you're down an operative and you're climbing out of a hole for the entire game yeah or if you just whiff right just uh it doesn't go off yeah it's actually my uh, my when i was looking back on my crude game where i got trashed on wtc because you've never played them, you're going to be super careful. And in hindsight, I was like, I think if I just run up, I I would have just run over him. It's the it's the staying back that gets you in the end sometimes. Yeah, the crew win the patient game. Yeah, just shotgun him. Jeez, I should have thought about that. Just shotgun him. <clears throat> yeah, Not too much of a fat guard player at heart. That is true. Actually, that's a good that's a good uh, point on talking about different play styles. Because you mentioned that you were playing scouts, but you also have been playing vet guard and you love elf. So you are bouncing literally between all three of the major play styles from time to time. And it sounds like you play on TTS, right, Yap? Yeah, I do. Yeah. So uh, I, I think I've played in most CPTS tournaments uh, since uh, last two years, uh, which has given me a bit of a, a broader scope. Uh, but I, mm -hmm. and I've never played the same team in any tournament so i've uh, i think i've played at like uh, 12 tournaments so far and i've never taken the same team so i'm uh, <laughs> uh I, i'm not very steady on on the team picks yeah dw's favorite customer the schizophrenics kill team player <laughs> i guess yeah i have a lot of painted teams i mean the benefit of tts obviously that i don't have to have to get all the teams though i think i have all the ones that i've that i've played but uh, yeah i guess my issue is that i like the look of elves but i don't like how they play and you don't uh, like being balanced on a knife's edge at all times. Exactly, it's too stressful. You know, I've got kids. I need to unwind when I'm playing uh, and kill team. So, uh, uh, and I love the idea of being elite, but I don't like losing. So then you end up with fat guard. That's basically. Um... What kind of things do you feel like you need to change in your headspace when you go from different teams, different team team play styles? So you mentioned that you've been doing very, you've done better with vet guard, but you like playing elves, you like playing elites. So obviously the play styles don't mix and match. You know, scouts, we just mentioned how if you had just gone aggressive against the crew player who's playing 12 operatives with basically no stat line against you, you could have just destroyed him if you just went up and started blasting, but you were stuck in the vet guard headspace. Do you have good little internal heuristics that let you reset to a new team, or do you have to play a team, get dunked on a little bit before you find the new way to play that team? Um, that's actually a really good question. Uh, and that's not, not to throw shade at the Dutch meta, but, but because it's not that strong, um, I can do reasonably well with most teams, even if I'm if I don't switch that headspace. But for instance, when I started playing Nemesis Claw, I instantly went for Recon. That just felt to me like that would be the best combination. Where some people would say, "No, they're seek and destroy," which I think shows sort of my like horde kind of thinking. I want to be in board control, you know, use the recover item uh, ploy to get ahead in score and then force my opponent to come to me. Um, so I think I, actually my my biggest uh, flaw is that I don't switch. I always play defensively, no matter uh, what team I play. And um, I think actually for Blades of Cain that works because they like to peel, you know, stay in arm at center and use their uh, mobility to kill something and dash back, uh, ideally. Uh, but for some other teams, like uh, for instance, when you need to stat check someone with scouts, yeah, I just, I don't see it until after the game. Yeah, but that would be a hard thing to see ahead of time. I think a lot of the people that do have the, that kind of foresight, it comes from like experience. So the fact that you you had that experience against Crew, uh playing conservatively didn't really work now that gives you the the opportunity to look back and find the lesson so that next time you can have the foresight to play more aggressively against a high-end crude player. Yeah, which will happen uh, anywhere in the next three years uh, based on their previous uh, uh, stats. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Daniel? Do you, You've played a couple other teams from time to time. It sounds like a lot of elites, you know, when you pick up another team, do you have any metrics that you use to try to adjust your headspace? 
getting used to two APL teams is a nightmare when you only <laughs> stay elite. It's, oh yeah, I can't do that. Oh wait, I can't move, shoot, dash back. Wait, that's not a possibility. Now I did play uh, Corsairs a bit, but uh, yeah, Elves, you know, you, if, if the wind is too hard, they die. So it, it's it, they were they die too quickly. They're very fast, but they just don't suit my play style. Uh, and it's it's just getting used to the fact, like you know, you're not a giant tank now. Obviously, you know, legionaries or nemesis claw aren't huge tanks either, but they can take some punishment and move forward. So it's it's definitely you know that being calm is one of the most important things in those kind of games. Just hang back, try and see the kind of the wait and see approach. The aggression doesn't really always work. Uh, I've played Hand of the Archon quite a bit as well. Uh, when I saw Corsairs, just wasn't it for me. I love the idea of Hand of the Archon. Uh, also, because I started my Games Workshop hobby way back when 3rd edition of 40k came out, and that was a Black Templar and Dark Eldar book set, which was awesome. You had pissed off elves with spiky heads, so I had to try Hand of the Archon here. Um, and I found that also a, d- a difficult team, but you know, it was more of a... Um, a very aggressive kind of team, which suited my playstyle coming from Legionaries back in that time, uh, where if you start to get kills, stuff starts to ramp up. You can give yourself an APL with the pain tokens. Uh, you can do other kind of shenanigans, which sort of made them a three APL team as well if things went your way. Uh, but you just had more people on the table. So I, I did find it hard, though. That's why I, I, I love my three APL. I really, really love it. <laughs> It does feel pretty great, especially yeah. on Into the Dark. Oh, yeah. 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 That board is Archon, a nightmare. Hand of the Archon, famously extremely hard to play on In the Dark because you really do not have the APL. I think Mandrakes also suffer from this a little bit, but luckily for Mandrakes, they can teleport on In the Dark. So for anyone who doesn't know, you can like teleport and get ready to go behind doors and stuff, which is pretty big. Yeah, that's the worst feeling in the world, having that duelist sitting behind a door being able to make a fantastic multi-charge, knowing that there's absolutely zero way you're going to get that done without first activating someone else to open the door and have her killed. 100%. I, I do wonder sometimes now that, you know, we've done uh, WTC, which for us was, uh, we trained for it. You know, the, the, we, we really started, when that thing started to happen, I got the team together and everyone started to get involved. We started training a lot, which taught us a lot about the game as well. Uh, obviously because the the rules are quite a steep learning curve, if you ask me. I wonder how I would play with Hand of the Orca now if I went back to them, knowing what I know now. Because uh, getting so much matches in, it, it changes so much of your perspective, how the game works, how you can bend the rules to your benefit. So I, I do wonder if I go back to Hand of the Orca now, if I would have a different experience. I suspect I suspect so. You know, as you get better and better, the two APL teams offer you way more room to make possibilities. Sure, your individual operatives might not be as good, but it's not necessarily true when you have things like APL modifiers to give you those hero plays, especially on teams like Kasserkin or any of the other teams that have plasma and weapons, right? It lets you do your charge fight shoot against the other seven wound, eight wound teams. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I mean, that's one of the things I, I notice as, as one of my pain points, right? If prescience doesn't go my way and I make one mistake positioning as an elite player, it's going to be an uphill battle. Uh, whereas, indeed, what you said with more operatives, you have more room. Uh, definitely agree on that. As an elite player, I'm actually kind of curious. You know, I've t- been talking about how when you have more operatives, you can send people out as bait. What Do you recall any examples in the WTC or during your practice games where a horde player set out a piece of bait and you had to try your hardest to ignore it because if you took it, you knew it was going to come back to bite you? Or was there a piece of bait that you accidentally took that you now looking back, you're like, oh man, I really shouldn't have taken that bait. I wish I had seen what they were setting up and kind of like how that feels. Um, so one that sticks to mind was a, a scout player. And uh, he had one of the uh, secondaries where you have to come into the other's uh, deployment zone. And there was this one flank of mine that was quite open for him to do so, twice, mind you. 
And I knew it was bait. I knew what, what this player was trying to do, but I had a choice, right? Either I had to go for him uh, to deny that point or ignore it and they get two secondaries, which doesn't seem major, but in the grand scheme of a game where you can get 24 points, it tallies up. So I did go for it uh, in the end, got lucky keeping one of my, uh, or keeping my plasma gunner back, uh, which wasn't a great idea. It worked out fine for me. Um, but it does, it, the choices that people give you sometimes, it's difficult and kind of puts you in a position where you have to rely on the luck of the dice and the dice don't like me. You know, ones on a supercharged shot are in, are not an infrequent uh, occurrence for me. Uh, there was one other game that that really caught me off guard was against a Wormblade player. Uh, this was online. And he put forward one of his, um, I think he had a grenade on it that was very scary if it got close. He forced me to grab it. I didn't understand why he put it there uh, at that moment. And, and then my brain just went in overload. Okay, so you got all these operatives. Why are you doing this? Why are you putting this guy here? I know you want to kill me. If I ignore you, and I can ignore you once extra with a Vox screen, but why? Why are you doing this? So I had to take the shot first thing, which I did see it, denied me uh, a few extra uh, victory points, but it was that or death. I mean, you know, easy choice, I guess, uh, at the end of it, but... It is one of the best tactics to use against elites because you only got so much people. And again, positioning is a major thing here. If you mess up on, or mess up on your positioning with your elites, it's going to be tough because getting back into a good position where you can get back stuff, it, 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 it's part of the learning curve because eventually you see this and after the game, you know, you talk with your opponent sometimes to see, okay, what could I have done better? And you talk about that bait that was set forward, obviously to draw you away. Uh, and then you start to learn more, how do I position better? Uh, and that changes a lot in that uh, and, and those kind of games. Yeah. That, um, that particular question is actually something that I've thought a bit about as an elite player as well. So, um, so there's there's two different approaches that I have when someone would dangle bait. One of them would be if they've already activated and they're in charge range, you just definitely charge them. Um, and like unless you're like in the threat saturated anti melee around you, um, but yeah, so you can just charge them and and just like hang out there. And now they're just like a foothold to to launch from later. Um, and the other thing is, uh, especially if you if you have someone that is going to push to the middle of the board and like stay hidden, if you can push to the middle of the board somewhere where you have a shot against that dangling bait, um, but you're obscured against the big targets that want to hit you back, then you can just set up a non-reciprocal and then you kill the bait and don't even give them the the catch for it. So you're just In like an ideal situation, just eats the worm off the hook and uh, doesn't get caught. In an ideal situation, definitely. But if you bring out bait and that bait is not covered, it's effectively the same as with chess, putting your queen in such a position that it just gets taken from you without repercussion. I mean, your goal is to kill an elite, right? You got six guys against you. If you can kill someone by giving up one of your operatives, you don't care. You know, you've, you've got, let's, let's say, you know, a scout player, you've got nine left. You don't care. Go ahead, grab him. You, you know, you're losing so much power losing an elite um, that, you know, for something to be effective bait, you got to have it covered in yeah. all ways. One of, one of the things I really uh, love with, with NC for it being more of a stronger elite team, and I know many people will disagree with me on that, is the Fearmonger. I love that guy. Poisoning objective against uh, non-elite teams uh, the threat of that grenade that he has with mortal wounds, getting off that extra mortal wounds at ready operative step. I've I've had interesting, uh, I wouldn't say discussion, but I've I've started a discussion on CPTS a bit, uh, trying to find out like why are people so in love with the heavy gunner? You know, people love the heavy bolter, and yeah, you can shoot twice. I'm like, yeah, of course you can shoot twice, but who in their right mind is going to give me a chance to shoot twice with them? And perhaps even Overwatch, that there is no chance for that. So that's why I love my Fearmonger. I would never trade him out. Maybe the Skin Thief, but I find him too valuable as well, also having a chance to shoot. 
Um, yeah, I, I, I love his poison. And that's where bait also becomes less relevant because you've poisoned an objective. Go ahead, go on it. You're going to get D3 mortal wounds next turn as well. Maybe you get one point out of it and then I can get a pot shot out on you and maybe have a bigger luck chance to eliminate said bait that was going to try and come into my flank. I've uh, I've been uh, baited uh, pretty uh, pretty obviously. It's actually a pretty good story. I was playing Hand of the Archon, and uh, my opponent put forward uh, a goon, and uh, it was an awful map. There was no way to stage anywhere forward. So I did what you said, uh, Jason. I just charged him, and I stood there. I was like, well, this is good for next turn. And then as I went through my activations, I thought, well, I think I can charge a couple more in there, and uh, two of them can even be obscured in case he uh, starts next turn. Yeah, the punchline of this joke, he was playing blooded. So uh, yeah, four guys in combat, you can shoot into combat. So that was a, that was a pretty nifty frag grenade coming my way. It was a five target diabolic grenade with... Uh... <laughs> I, I actually, dice totally built me out. It was just a crack from the grenadier and he did zero damage, even though he could hit four targets. So I was super duper lucky, but I got baited real good. Like four guys in the middle <laughs> yeah it happens didn't happen twice but it happened once yeah that's uh it's uh, you know that a good lesson learned even though it uh didn't end up hitting you that hard well when he said i uh, okay so uh, i'm gonna shoot i'm like no you can't i'm in engagement well actually i have a ploy which circles back to the what happens if you play against a team that you've never played before yeah it can blindside you pretty bad that's actually a good point, you know, talking about newer scenes and how you can develop your player base and the culture of a new burgeoning scene. I think a really good way to go about playing matches where you're not really sure what might be happening is asking for what your team can break on the rules. So, for example, if you walk up to a crew player, you've never played against them before. Be like, oh, what like core rules of the game does your team break? Because as everybody knows, rules exist, but rules writers exist to break them. Because it's no fun if you just play chess to play chess. You know, we're not here to play chess. We're here to play Tau or Space Marines. You know, Space Marines rule break. I shoot on death. Not a thing that you get to do. Vet guard. I get to stand around when I die. Croot. I get to steal objectives when I can't control them. You know, asking for these very specific points on what what lets you? What does your team do that lets you break the core rules of the game so that you can at least think about them? And if your opponent is acting in good faith, which ideally, you know, most kill team players are, if you ask them those kinds of questions, people are pretty good at explaining the big gotchas. And the diabolic grenade would have been a great one. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that's uh, one of the things that shows how immature our meta is. Like. Because I played a lot of CPTS, I learned to ask those questions. I even put it forward in one of the guys I wrote for the, the Dutch Guild Team community. But in the Netherlands, it's super common that when you do something and your opponent knows that he can punish that move because he breaks the rules, he will tell you like, oh, actually, I can shoot into combat. So if you charge him to not get shot, I can, I can shot you. So there's a lot more take backs like it's OK, you know, we're, just, we're all just learning so we're really still in that phase where you don't really have to ask what your opponent does because he will warn you if you're about to do something stupid because you're you're about to break the rules um which will come by uh, back and bite you in the ass if you go to wtc because they won't they will ask you do you know my team and if you say yes <laughs> well <laughs> good luck yeah i do think that was something that i've heard about the wtc is that the wtc because of the way the rules are structured and your goal in any given game is the widest possible points delta it is a much more cutthroat environment compared to even just u.s tournaments like at lvo you could probably ask your opponent and they'll probably say like are you sure you know my team well and they'll give you like one more chance before you confidently walk into the jaws of your own demise yeah i uh, to be fair i i had mixed uh experiences on that matter and i personally maybe i'm a bit too much of a softy so i had one opponent uh i did a stupid scouting where you dash someone up on a the dash the sniper up on a vantage behind a barricade and because he has ignore obscurity and can basically shoot you if he can see you and my opponent dashed plunderers his corsair right in front of him in front of light barricade and i was like you know he he can ignore obscuring right and he was yeah i know so, okay and then I said, okay, I'll take initiative and I'll shoot that guy. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, I ignore obscuring. And he's like, oh God, I was totally thinking you meant something else. And I, and I actually let him take it back. But to his credit, he didn't take it. 
he said, I put him there. You warned him. You warned me. You can shoot him. So yeah, that was uh, that was interesting. But I, I definitely felt that most of the games on WT were not cutthroat. There was quite a, a bit of sportsmanship. Good to hear. Yeah. Yeah, the level of play was high, but it I, I had fun. People were nice. I didn't have any game where my opponent was, you know, sweaty in that sense. Yeah, I'm always just like very, very pleased to hear that like the level of play and the level of sportsmanship in Kill Team is, has just been like super high, it seems like, at a lot of these events. And like that's such a great combo. It makes for like such a healthy game. Yeah, and it was more fun yeah. as well. Yeah. Sorry. It's more fun, and does it really feel like a victory if you got at your opponent? Because then it wasn't really about you know the the tactical play. It was about you didn't know my team well enough. And I think by now there's 34. At the end of this season, it's looking like there'll be 42. Uh, we don't even have 42 active skill team players. So you you can gotcha me on at least 16 teams any day of the year. So yeah, I, I also think that that's not really the spirit of Kill Team. It's about positioning and making the right decisions, having the information that you should have playing into en enemy teams. Yeah, I think that's one of the joys of having a new game system with a new meta and new players. And a lot of basically people who were around 40k slowly filtering into the scene is it is a newer scene and it can be a much healthier one compared to something like 40k where I feel like a lot of players that I talk to, they're just there to, oh, I've built this crazy box of stats and if you can't, if you can't figure it out, you die. Yeah, that's beautiful. I've never actually played 40k in my life. I started with Kill Team. I, I've never played 40k or any other war game, so I have no idea. But I do occasionally see the Reddit post going like in crazy dead ball mechanics, which is, I guess, fun or, to make. <laughs> or, you know, even in the WTC, there was a hundred Space Marine March where the Black Templars with Feel No Pains just walked at their opponents and you just can't kill them fast enough. Doesn't matter how many guns you got. Basically, where uh, Jason is trying to get uh, the intercessors and kill team to uh, right, just move everything <laughs> forward and shoot them. That's that's already it works. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so all you shout really want is a five feel no pain. Yeah, <clears throat> shout out to the Discord where we had a couple players talk about using these ridiculous strats and winning their games. So you know it is working at least a little bit on our. <laughs> In the and like in the command point Discord, uh, I've kind of been chatting about that in there, and other people are like popping in there. They're like, mm, "Yeah, I tried it. Worked weirdly well." <laughs> it does sound like a, a match that is really, really fun to watch. Yeah, I don't know if it's quick. fun to play into. <laughs> uh, yeah, not necessarily. I, I get that. Yeah, they get salty opponents, or not that many. Um, everyone's generally been a pretty good sport about it. Um, I, I think the Incursor version was a little bit worse than the Intercessor one, just because people, like, don't see the angles, and, like, I, I mean, like, I've even had games where I told someone about it, uh, like, you know, just, like, a 30 minutes, just like, wow, this is an interesting thing, and then they're like, ah, oh, skeptical, ask a couple questions, and then they're like, okay, maybe it does work, and then we play the game, and, like, it's a completely different thing when it's actually on the tabletop, because it's like, okay, you, I know all about it, I think I can, like, set up out of it, and then just the angles are absolutely insane, so it's just, like, um, on pretty much every map, there's enough room to hide like four 25 millimeter bases, and if they move to score or to threaten anything, they die. And uh, everywhere else on the map is just like the danger zone, and you're definitely gonna die. Nice. I definitely have different results when I shoot with incursors. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Things dying when I shoot with incursors are fairly rare, I'd say. Yeah, it's like 40 percent of your shots actually kill, but you take so many shots that it's totally fine. Right, I get that. Yeah, sounds fair. I don't pull the trigger twice. As yeah. they say, only the Space Marines have Vulture Discipline. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, I've actually kind of been curious. Um, I One thing I might do is track the number of shots that I take per turning point and per game, and then just like post the results, and people will be like, oh yeah, I take that many shots as a insert faction here player. And then when you actually look at it, it'll be like Vetguard shoots like zero to three times in the first turning point intercession shoots uh 20 times in the first turning point including overwatch and then uh that's just looking at the numbers there it's gonna be like uh yeah that's this is a disgusting disparity and i see why it works i'm uh, curious now i gotta see that sometime yeah well uh I've, maybe i gotta just boot up my tts sometime and we could uh get a game 
Yeah, we can do a fat guard versus uh, winter sessions, just marching up and shooting him off the table. Yes. I mean, yeah. I guess that's like the worst possible matchup to do that in, maybe. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, Vet Guard was way scarier when their mind went through walls. Uh, actually, part of the whole reason that like drove me to all engage was pre nerf Vet Guard because just there's there's nothing you can do to hide. It's just like uh, if I stage somewhere, it's like the spotter spots you and you get sniped anyways. If you're like hiding completely behind a wall in heavy cover, they blow you up through the wall. So it's just like if you're gonna hit me, no matter what I do, I might as well have an engage order. And then I just kind of yeah, started noodling yeah. around with that a little bit. And then uh, then it turned into, like, Overwatch is extremely important. So it's like, if I'm just, like, standing somewhere that threatens an objective, and, like, I'm taking a bunch of sh incoming shots anyways, but, like, if if now I get an Overwatch at the end of it all, then that's a pretty big upgrade. Um, Yeah, so that's definitely part of the formula. Um, And then, like, this particular version with Intercession... You take mobile, so you can always fall back for one APL, because uh, part of the thing that made, was tough for incursors is if someone just like charges an incursor and then the incursor can't fight his way out, you could lose the whole activation, which is a very big deal. But with mobile on intercession, if someone charges an intercessor, you just fall back and there's no breaks on the bolt gun train. You just keep on shooting. Um, and then the other one is deadly sharpshooter, which is <coughs> makes your bolt guns 3-3 three, three, mortal wounds 1. And just the, I give auto bolt rifles to everyone. And with your doctrines and ceaseless.